David Porter, professor of history at Virginia College in Charleston, South Carolina, and at Trident Technical College in Charleston, South Carolina. This evening I'm going to tell you about a chain of wisdom. You see, no one gets wise by accident. There's no such thing as a person who is completely self-made. We are all wise only because someone before us passed some wisdom down to us and then we took it with our experiences and moved forward. Here are some examples to that. Back in the 1800s, you had the great freedom fighter Frederick Douglass. And because his uh, mistress taught him how to read and write, he went on to get a book called The Columbian Orator, which taught him the masters of eloquence and he learned from reading of great speakers, such as Sit the ancient Roman Cicero, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and the like. And he memorized these type of speeches, and he eventually used that with his own experiences and intelligence to become the great speaker that he was. Well, many years later, when he was a very old man, there was a young man who had become pretty wise himself. The young man managed to was born in slavery. And he traveled from Malden, West Virginia, all the way over to Hampton, Virginia, to gain an education at uh, Hampton Institute, which is now Hampton University. But he didn't take that education just to enrich himself. He took that education to help form a school down in Tuskegee, Alabama, which educated many generations of the descendants of the people who were in slavery, and continues to do so today. Here I'm speaking of Booker T. Washington. On a number of occasions, Booker T. Washington sought the counsel of the great Frederick Douglass, who passed that wisdom on down to him. Booker T. Washington took it and moved forward. Well, near the end of Booker T. Washington's life, there was another young man who wanted to learn some wisdom and leadership. So he began to correspond with Booker T. Washington. The two of them exchanged about six or seven friendly letters where Booker T. Washington taught the young man about leadership and wisdom and so forth and gave him good counsel. So much so that Booker T. Washington invited this young man to spend some time at Tuskegee with him so that they could learn some, so that they could build and reason together. Well, as it turned out, the young man reached America after Booker T. Washington died because, you know, boat travel was kind of slow in those days. But this young man took Booker T. Washington's teachings and took them to help build, and took them to, along with his initiative to build the largest black organization of its time, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Here I'm referring, the young man that Booker T. Washington helped to teach in this fashion was Marcus Garvey. Well, Marcus Garvey was eventually arrested on questionable grounds of mail fraud some years later. But there were many who were inspired by Marcus Garvey's teachings, including a young man in Michigan. The young man in Michigan began writing a series of letters to President Calvin Coolidge of the United States to help see that Garvey was released. Well, guess what? Garvey was released from prison, but he was deported back to his native Jamaica. But this young man had a son who he passed some of those teachings on down to, and the son took them to the next level. The man who I'm speaking of here is the Reverend Earl Little, who took Garvey's teachings and put a little bit of it into his very small son, who. Uh, was six years old when he was killed by a streetcar. But the young son, after the father died, uh, some years went on, and he took Garvey's teachings to the next level and tried to build a link between the blacks in America and the blacks of Africa. Here I'm speaking of the Reverend Earl Little's son, Malcolm Little, who we know today as Malcolm X. Well, along with that, around the same time that uh, young Malcolm was a little boy, over in India, you had Mohandas Gandhi, who was doing what he could to free the people of India from the tyr tyrannical rule of the British. So, at this point, many black Americans became aware of what Gandhi was doing. Well, by 1935, Gandhi had evolved into his attitudes, especially when it came to African Americans. So, a delegation of them came to see, came to see uh, Gandhi and said, Gandhi, please come to America and do what you can to help free the black people in America from Jim Crow and lynchings and that sort of thing. Gandhi said, well, I'd love to, that's a great idea, but, you know, I wish I could, but the problem is i got to finish this thing here and make it work here before I can work anything else. So, 
the black gentleman said, well, uh, we're sorry to have wasted your time, uh, Mr. Gandhi. And the guy said, no, 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 it may be through the American Negro that the world will see what nonviolence is all about. And the black gentleman said, huh? And Garvey said, trust me, trust me. Well, among that delegation was a Dr. Mordecai Johnson, who was the president of Howard University. And he once spoke before a group of young people about that experience. One of them had been searched, the young people had been searching the answers to the problems of blacks in America. And he thought, hey, if I take this guy's Gandhi's teachings and bring it over here, it might work to that end. That young man was Martin Luther King. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, there was a chain of wisdom that went on. And this is why it's so important that if you are a wise person, pass some of that wisdom. Don't be bitter and hoard your information against young people and try to hold them back. Give your wisdom to them so they can take it and move forward after you're gone. This is Damon Fordham talking about chain of wisdom. Thank you.